This is our Rice Ramp Architectural Saturday Engineering. Uh, welcome to have some pioneers back. Okay. Uh, oh, Keegan's in the room. Okay, but uh, JP is good to see you. Uh, so I'm going to hurry up and get out of the way because I know it's past our start time. So the floor is yours, Dave. Thank you all so much. Sure, thanks for having us. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Raise your hand if you were here last time. Nice to see you. Your last episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. Our last, sorry, our last episode. <laughs> it's nice to have you all back with us. Um, my name is David, and I'm Lauren. And we have a couple of volunteers with us from Rice today. So if you guys can come and introduce yourselves. So let's start with Patty. And where are you visiting? Where are you from? Uh, Great, so she's a graduate student, right? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sai from Tianjin, China, and uh, this is my final year of, as a graduate student at Rice. Okay. My name is JP, I'm also a graduate student at Rice. I was here a lot last year, so I recognize uh, several of you. Um, it's nice to see you everyone. It's a good time to be back. And Keegan was also here. Uh, JP and Keegan set up the recess program, so a lot of the slides I can see today were actually started by them. So, thanks guys. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking about communication. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of items that we covered in our last session to kind of refresh your memory, and then we'll move on to the new content. Um, okay, uh-oh. <laughs> so, we are going to be talking about the built environment. Um, so here we have an aerial view of Houston. And I'm wondering if you guys can help us point out a couple of elements within the built environment that you see in this photo. What, what do you think constitutes the built environment? Okay, so we see a lot of kind of public space or well-designed space, okay. What else do we see in this photo? Buildings, yeah, absolutely. Buildings are a super important part of the built environment. Uh, what else do we see in this, in this photograph that like, wants to the built environment? Okay, streets, yeah. So we have public spaces, we have streets, buildings. A lot of empty space, but for parking. Okay, a lot of parking lots, a lot of pavement. Is there anything else that stands up? Parks. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Lights are great. Yeah, I gave it away. <laughs> what else is there in here? Schools. <laughs> okay, pools are definitely an important part of the built environment, especially here. Especially in Houston. Anything else? Parks. So we can see like a, a couple of parks. Uh, okay, so as architects, we deal mainly with the built environment, right? So that includes buildings, as we said, that can include streets, it can include lights, parks, uh, community spaces, open spaces, and things like that. So uh, when we're talking about architecture, those are kind of the terms that we're, that we're setting up. Can you guys tell us what STEM stands for? Yes. Science, technology, engineering. Right. So you might wonder how architecture fits into STEM. And you actually, if you change it to STEAM, you get arts and architecture in the mix, and the rest stays the same as well. Um, but it's important to kind of think about how that situates itself in, and how, how might science be part of architecture? Right. Um, so you can take both math and science, and you get that in the ways that architectural materials are made, um, doing different calculations for the building itself. Um, how do you think engineering or technology might relate to architecture? Building. Yeah, so you typically need engineers to help you um, construct buildings. 
um, they do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, and then we use technology every day to uh, help us from the design side and the construction side. Yeah. So today we're going to be discussing technology quite a bit and how that relates to communication. Okay, so how do you become an architect? This is us. Uh, you can probably find each of the volunteers in this photo. Uh, so in order to become an architect, you have to do well in school, obviously. Uh, and you have to kind of figure out uh, what you're good at and what you might like to pursue as a career that will kind of bring you fulfillment and make you happy and uh, produce meaningful work. Uh, so we're hoping that by you know, teaching these lessons and uh, showing you guys a little bit about what architects do, you guys might consider pursuing a career in architecture. So there are a number of, or there's eight uh, schools that teach architecture here in Texas. Um, in Houston specifically, there's Rice University, where we're obviously from, as well as the University of Houston. Um, but throughout the rest of the state, we have Texas Tech, Texas A&M, uh, University of Texas. I actually went to the University of Texas in Arlington, so I've been to two Texas schools. So I might be an expert on Texas architecture programs by now. Um, so yeah, now we're going to kind of transition into the uh, content that we discussed last time with structures. So, structure in buildings. Does anyone recognize the, the building? Yes, what's another name for that? Yeah, the Astrodome. Okay, so the Astrodome is a very significant structural building. Um, it is the first steel dome that was ever constructed. And the engineers who designed this uh, basically said, okay, how far away are we going to have to move this thing? Because once this collapses, people are going to come after us. <laughs> Fortunately, it has been standing this entire time since the 1960s. Uh, but this is kind of a, a really uh, significant structure building. So what I would like everyone to do is go ahead and stand up. So, what are some of the components in your body that help you to stand up and resist? Yeah. Okay, bones. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Spine. I'm sorry? Spine. Spine, okay. So, bones, spine, yeah. Muscles, absolutely, for sure. So, you guys can go ahead and sit back down. So, just like, just like your body has a skeleton, muscles, bones, uh, buildings kind of operate in a similar way. So you can see here the kind of human skeleton um, in comparison to the Statue of Liberty and the John Hancock building. So just like you have um, bones which help you to resist gravity, your bones all connect uh, through muscles, buildings operate in a very similar way. They have a kind of skeletal structure and then those are connected together to resist Okay, so there are many different options and many different ways that structure can be provided for buildings. Um, kind of take this room as an example. We see that we have some concrete columns in the middle of the room here. That's helping the building to stand up. We also have these beams overhead. These kind of act like the structural skeleton that help the building to resist gravity. So there's also a number of other kind of more uh, artistic or expressive ways that architects can use structure in buildings. Um, from the kind of example of a cast iron arch to a parabolic concrete shell, uh, we have a kind of curtain wall that's cut in glass. And then this is the bird's nest in China that actually has uh, kind of crisscrossing concrete uh, columns that provide a kind of artistic expression. You can also the cardboard tubes. Oh yeah, so your bonds church with cardboard tubes that can be taken down and recycled. So there are a number of different uh, structural systems that architects can select to help their buildings stand up. Um, so as we discussed last time, there are two kind of basic forces um, that are acting on buildings. You can think about uh, pulling force or tension, as well as a pushing force. 
So to kind of illustrate that, um, if we take this group again, the columns that you see are in compression. Gravity is pushing down on those, but they're resisting by pushing back up. Um, and ultimately, in buildings, we want the forces to be balanced in order to help them stand up and be stable. So last time we were here, um, we kind of illustrated these in different ways. Um, we have the post and lintel, which I know you remember the exercise from last week, um, where we had everyone stand and then push their arms together and try and resist the force. Um, we had the arch, which was also similar. Um, just the top piece, you guys hold up your hands out like this. Um, and then we talked about how the top of it is really key to helping that stand. We looked at the dome as well, um, which is similar to the arch in its circular nature and how each piece kind of helps the whole thing stand. And then you look at the space frame um, and how the different elements within that um, piece together. And we did one of these, each person, and everyone relied on each other to uh, kind of help that stand up. So what can structures do for you guys? What building is this? Yes. So how does this structure help the building? Can you think of any ways that it might make the space more productive? So in this room you see columns. You see any columns on the field? That might be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> so they use the space frame to create really, really big spaces, um, which helps you free up the ground so that the games can be played, but also provides a lot of space for um, fans to sit, which is crucial in that <laughs> area. All right, so do you guys have any questions before we move on to communication about what we discussed in the structure? That's pretty clear. All right, great. So today we're going to be talking about communication. Architecture is heavily reliant on communication. Um, as architects, we have to communicate ideas about buildings and the built environment, um, and we have to do that in an effective way so that people understand the ideas or uh, the types of concepts that we are imagining. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of communicating within the built environment. So we're kind of back to this first photo, and I wonder if you guys can kind of point out a couple of elements in this photo that represent communication. So communication can be words, it can be images, it can be um, a sense of use or occupation. Did you have the spacing of each building. Okay, the spacing of each building could be a way to communicate. What do you think that might communicate? How much area of the land what takes Okay, okay, so how particular buildings might relate to one another. So if buildings are related in use, they might be closer or maybe spread a little bit further apart. That's a good, that's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge part of communication in the built environment. Advertising. Huge, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of intersections and like street lights. Okay, street lights and crosswalks. Absolutely. What do those communicate? <laughs> um, <laughs> in Houston, they communicate something different. <laughs> oh, well, where people can walk or what? Um, maybe they try to make them feel safe. Yeah. At the nighttime. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> Yeah, signs, stoplights, absolutely. So these were all really great examples of communication in the built environment. So as architects, we have to take all of these kind of factors into account when we are uh, designing buildings. Okay, so architects heavily rely on um, communication, as we said, to convey concepts, um, express a design, encourage collaboration, and construct buildings. So, Believe it or not, this is actually a sketch for a real building uh, that was done by Frank Gehry. So this is kind of 
one element of written communication. You also have verbal communication. Um, here you see JP Keegan <laughs> presenting to a group. Um, verbal communication is really important uh, in helping to explain something to someone else, to get a concept across, um, and to just push the design along in that particular way. You also have visual communication, which David kind of touched on before. Um, drawings are really helpful in visual communication. Uh, we do all sorts of different things within drawing to help better communicate to people who are going to see those drawings that you might not be able to verbally communicate with. Um, so you can see here um, an older picture of a bunch of draftsmen um, creating drawings for a particular building. So in the two uh, slides which we just discussed, both in terms of verbal and visual, there are different audiences that uh, the architect or student <laughs> is attempting to uh, kind of communicate to. So in the first example, in terms of verbal communication, you can see that the audience here is kind of a large group. It looks like they might be students that are visiting rice. And so there's a very kind of particular uh, way that an architect would present to these students. Um, in comparison to what you see here, so this is an architectural office uh, that's producing drawings that might communicate to a contractor or a builder or someone who owns or lives in a building uh, in a more technical way. So in thinking about audience, architects have to select which type of communication they're going to use in order to provide the most effective message. So you can see um, how other careers might also require successful communication, um, such as drawings. So these are patent drawings. Um, can you recognize any of these things? Yes? Uh, right. So this is a patent drawing for Lego. It shows the different aspects of it that are crucial to its design. Um, anyone else? Recommends it once, yes? Mm -hmm. So we have the Nike Mads um, in their patent drawings. Does anyone recognize the one in the middle? Anyone that can't read this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an espresso machine, which you may not be able to see too quickly. Uh, but in each of these drawings, you can kind of see how the objects which are being communic communicated are drawn in their most simple expression. They're drawn without color, they're drawn with very little shadow, and they're heavily kind of dotated. There's lots of little uh, numbers and figures and references and dimensions that describe the object without kind of giving you a picture of what the object literally is. Right, so as David was saying, in, in this one, for example, you have numbers that pull off, and then you have text that backs up that drawing to help explain to so just like these patent drawings, architects produce very uh, abstracted technical drawings to describe buildings. Okay, so we're going to talk about the different types of drawings that architects use, uh, which are geared toward a specific audience and situation. So let's take our friendly orange as an example. <laughs> okay. So if you can picture an orange, right, this is kind of your standard kind of photograph of the orange. There's light, there's color, there's shadow, reflection. This is kind of an orange as you would see it in everyday life. Uh, so the first kind of conventional drawing that architects produce in order to lay out and design buildings are called floor plans. Has anyone heard of a floor plan? Yeah. yeah, they also <laughs> used to be called blueprints, but they're not called floor plans, just so that you know. Uh, <laughs> so if we're thinking about our orange on the right there. Um, imagine that you take that delicious orange, you cut it in half, and then you hold up that half to look at the inside. And that's what a plan is. So we apply the same uh, kind of logic to the design of a building. So if you were to think about taking a building and cutting it in half, and then picking up that half that you cut and looking inside, that's what a floor plan drawing would look like. So this is a very, very um, 
widely used and uh, kind of standard conventional drawings that architects will use to communicate an idea about, this, about buildings. So in all of these examples, we'll be looking at kind of a basic house. Um, so you can see in the floor plan of this house, we have a stair drawn in the middle. We have the larger living and dining room spaces next to the stair. And then the smaller spaces, like the kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom, up towards the, the top of the sheet there. All right, so the next conventional drawing that architects use is section drawings. So if you can imagine that a plan is kind of cut horizontally, a section is actually cut vertically through a building. So if we take our orange and we change the direction of the cut from horizontal to vertical, now we're looking at a kind of section of the orange. So now you see the, the kind of two halves or lobes <laughs> of the orange. You can see the stem in the middle and the skin on the outside. So architects would use this um, as a conventional drawing to think about the way that spaces in a house, in this example, are arranged vertically. So in this example, you can see our living and our dining room from before. You see the stair. But now we can see, hey, that stair is actually going all the way from the basement up to the second floor. So we can understand how people will move through the building. And then we can also start to see how windows will let light into the space, how we might think about the ceiling heights, and uh, how the spaces are going to be arranged as the building is stacked up. All right, the third convention that we're going to talk about is elevation. So again, if we're thinking about our friendly little orange, uh, we have a photograph of him. The photograph is showing perspective, it's showing light and shadow, as we said. Um, if we take an elevation of the orange, we're going to take away all of that perspective, all of that um, kind of light and shadow and texture, and just show it as an abstract object. So just like the pattern drawings that we saw earlier, um, elevations are line drawings which are abstracted versions of what we would see in real life. So in our house example again, we're seeing the house from the outside this time. We see it as a flat kind of 2D plane, and we see how the kind of windows are uh, situated, we see the balcony, we see the scale, how it might fit into the context of the neighborhood. We see a car, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but everything is flat now, right? We're not seeing this in perspective as we might see it in real life. So what architects would do is they would kind of combine plan, section, and elevation drawings to describe a project or a building or in this case, a house. So if you can kind of imagine that the plan, section, and elevation are um, the ways in which we might describe the orange. These are also the most common ways that architects will design and uh, communicate ideas about buildings. And it's important to talk about audience for these drawings. So since these are kind of conventional drawings, what that means is they kind of set up a language that certain people will understand. So has anyone ever seen maybe a plan drawing or an elevation or not here at recess? <laughs> Where have you seen one? Um, Okay. Okay. Awesome. Like with and height. That's another way that we describe space. Perfect. Perfect. Has anyone else seen like a plan drawing or an elevation drawing? Okay. So I think that that shows you that there's a pretty limited audience for these types of drawings, right? On the fire escape. Sure. Fire escape plan. That's a pretty common one that you'll see in buildings. I'll show you the way out. But this language is um, used by architects, builders, contractors, and owners, um, not necessarily as a way to communicate to you guys, the general public, but more as a way to kind of communicate amongst themselves. So if I showed Lauren a plan of a building that I was designing, Lauren would be able to read it and kind of understand what's going on. But if I wanted to show my or communicated idea about uh, a building to you or you, I might choose a different mode of representation or a different mode of communication. I might choose to show you a photograph or a rendering. 
um, because that might be a little bit easier for you to understand since it's less abstract. It's also important to think about how each of these communicates differently. So like David was saying, when you're looking at a plan and section, if, if we're designing a house for you, for example, it might be helpful to show you how the bedroom connects to a bathroom or how the bedroom sits in relation to the other rooms. And the same thing in the section to show you where your stairs sit or how windows play um, into that kind of scheme. And then the elevation is much more um, of an outside view. So in thinking about audience and what these show, um, each one would be for a different kind of perspective or even within the same client to show them different aspects of that building and how they might relate to each other. Yeah. So do you guys have any questions on conventional drawings so far? No? Do you guys feel like you have a pretty good grasp on what these are? Okay, because we're going to ask you to draw a couple of them now. So it's your last chance. Do engineers use the same drawings? Yes. Engineers will use the same drawings. Thank you for your question, Keith. <laughs> so as we talked about um, the conventional drawing set up a language that you know, uh, related disciplines will understand. So when I send a floor plan to an engineer to look at, let's say, structural engineer, um, he'll be able to identify, OK, this is where the columns are. This is where your beams are. Those look a little bit too small. I'm not going to beat those up. But he'll be able to use the same type of drawing uh, to communicate his ideas about structure. And just like architects use these to communicate with each other, engineers often have used these and then they use additional drawings to communicate within um, their own kind of aspects. So you might have a diagram that shows the structure, only the structure, um, or a plan that shows only the pipes in the building so that you can see those on their own. Okay, so we're going to take a little break now. We're going to sit at the back tables and we're going to have, do an activity. We'll ask each of you to draw one of, or select uh, one of the conventional drawing types and you're going to draw the place where you live. Uh, so you're either, we're going to ask you to draw either a plan section or an elevation. Um, so you can kind of hopefully use your imagination to uh, imagine your bedroom or your kitchen or your entire house. And then we'll come back and review those together.